Hi, I'm Glyn from Mr. Glyn's Pickups, and today I'm going to be talking with Trevor Binford from Binford Luthiery. Trevor makes arch tops, he makes flat tops, he makes ukuleles, he makes electric guitars, he makes basses, he makes pretty much anything you ask him to. Not only that, he's a very busy guitar repairer, not only that, he runs a school of luthiery. So if you wanted to learn how to make a one-off guitar, your dream guitar, or learn to make guitars in general, you need to talk to Trevor, which is exactly what I'm about to do. Please subscribe down below. Thank you very much. Hi Trevor, really good to see you, mate. And you too, thank you. You got your workshop there behind you. That's looking really cool in there. Is that? Oh, I see oh. you got some big machinery, great. I have, I spoiled <laughs> myself a bit. <laughs> good man. Hey, I was just, I was just saying, in a, I, I, I made a little intro there, and I was just saying what you do, you know, you make guitars, you repair guitars, you've got your school of luthiery, um, do you get enough sleep? <laughs> I, oh, I definitely do, yeah, I definitely do. The, um, the workshops, sort of, a lot of the spaces that I've sort of made available for people wanting to do guitar build shops, um, everybody has day jobs, so the slots that I make available are in the evening, afternoon. So uh, I'm more of a night owl anyways, so I end up sleeping late into the morning, you know, and um, not that late, but then get down here and, and start work on other stuff. Oh, cool. Yeah. So what's, what, what, what takes up most of your time? Um, I, I would say uh, it's probably mostly repairs and servicing at the moment because it is sort of a bread and butter for people that, that do um, work with instruments. When I went to school, they, they sort of told us, yeah, everybody wants to come in here and build guitars and that, and, and we'll teach you this. Um, but you also need to know the ins and outs of repairing because when you put up your, your details, people will bring broken instruments and want to give you money to do this. So it's part of the trade, it's part of the business, and um, I actually quite enjoy it a, a, a lot. Um, and you learn a lot through the years, a lot about different instruments and designs and take a little bit from every one. And I think it improves your building as well. Yeah, so. definitely. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. It's really, I find sometimes you get a guitar and you go, wow, this sounds so good. And you're trying mm. to find out why. Why? Yeah, it's absolutely. Great learning. Yeah, sure. You can never answer it definitively, unfortunately, but, but. Absolutely. There's a voodoo in there, the element of that, which, um, We'll keep chasing. Yeah, I think I think it's a combination of materials. At the end of the day, I don't think there's ever a a one thing. It's not like mm -hmm. you know electric guitar swamp ash. I don't. Yeah. 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 yeah, swamp ash is great, but I think everything has to combine. So yeah, yeah. which makes it, yeah, it makes it difficult. Mm. Do you do you play much? Um, I've played for years. Uh, I remember very distinctly getting for Christmas uh, an acoustic guitar, a Washburn. Well, it was made by Washburn, Oscar Schmidt. Um, that was something they were running for a while and, you know, pretty pretty entry level. And so I played acoustic for a lot of years and through high school, so mostly what I did. Um, loved it. Realized I wouldn't make any money playing acoustic guitar or, or any guitar, but uh, still enjoyed it. And um, At some point got into um, messing around with the setup of my guitar and realizing certain things changed, you know, playability and all that and realized, man, I've been playing this guitar for ages and it's really difficult to play, which is, which is what you probably heard from a lot of people. If you've done servicing for 25 years or, or what, it, what yeah. you've done, and, um, you realize these, some things are adjustable and you can improve it and it shouldn't be a struggle to play your guitar. <laughs> mm. so, so how did you, how did you learn to, um, to repair and build? Yeah, well, to repair uh, was to get into it. I was in, in high school at a boarding school in um, Seattle, just south of Seattle. Um, and uh, a friend of mine that went to the school there had gone off to this school in British Columbia, Summit School of Guitar Building and Repair. And uh, he says, oh, I'm going to do this and asked him about it later. And he says, oh, no, it was a great year. And so he did the year long course, which they teach uh, building and repair uh, there in Qualicum on British, uh, in British Columbia on Vancouver Island. So uh, I was living in Alaska full at the time um, and making very good money doing random jobs and uh, still living with my folks because I was pretty young. 
and saved up a whole lot of money delivering pizza and working in an office in a hospital and, and um, uh, blew it all on school. So <laughs> went, off to, <laughs> went off to guitar building school and uh, that was really good. I, f I didn't know if I'd ever get a job in the field, you know, sort of a dream at the time. You're, but I was, I, I'm a realist and under no illusions that it's a difficult thing sometimes. And, but after school, right at the end of my year, um, uh, Benedetto uh, was, was hiring and one of the people working there at the time uh, in the finishing department had gone to the school that I went to. So they called up the teachers and said, is there anybody you'd recommend to send down to Georgia uh, to work in our, in our shop down in, in Savannah, Georgia? So, by, um, sorry, by Benedetto, you mean the Benedetto? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Bob Benedetto, of course, yeah. that was sort of, that was the master's, degree. yeah, that was the end of the year process at, at the school I was going to was build an arch top guitar, an acoustic arch top guitar, which is like, oh, you think you know this, and out of school you don't really know much anyways, but like, you know, that's how it is with any job, or a lot of professions, I believe, or a lot of careers, and uh, they didn't care at Benedetto, I showed up there with a cab bill and only a bunch of Canadian dollars and they welcomed me in and, and Bob and Cindy were there and says oh you know come on in and work with Bob for a couple of weeks just just so he could see if uh, I'd make the mustard and what I did there was pretty rubbish because it was you know the second or th you know third guitar that an arch top I'd worked on and he says oh you'll do just wants to know if you want to if you wanted to do it basically is all he wanted to know and uh, so worked there for a couple of years in Georgia Great time, awesome time. Loved every minute of it. Really, really good stuff. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and, so, and so, what, 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 what were you doing there? Good question. Uh, well, I, I got hired to um, glue arch top necks to arch top bodies. That was what my job position was. Which uh, nothing you know, trivial, man. <laughs> Yeah, I mean everybody's eyeing you up because you got you got people on your left and your right from both sides of the process. They've been making the necks, <laughs> they've been making the bodies, and you're in charge of putting them together. And so they're wanting to know, <laughs> you know, are you going to screw things up? Are you gonna, <laughs> are you here to do the job or what? And 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 it took me, you know, it takes you a little bit. You learn this and that, but it was the best gig you could have gotten in in that factory or factory assembly line, whatever you want to say. It was, it was really great. It was quite an intimate 12, 14 people, all with work benches and hand tools doing the job, you know, some machines in the other room, a lot of machines to do the hard work, but, um, or the heavy work, but mostly hand work, and, you know, still made the old fashioned way, basically. In fact, I was there when they were transferring um, uh, Benedetto's carves, which was on copy carvers uh, for years that he'd made himself or, or had somebody make. I think this was on, went back when he was in Jersey or in Florida, I'm not really sure. Anyways, he was putting it all on CNC. And so that was pretty cool to see. The, so that was like the sort of pentagraph type. Yeah. Yeah, thing. Wow. Yeah, yeah, he had a guy that had just graduated from Savannah College of Art and Design. He was a local boy, didn't know anything about guitar, but really great at design and, and knew his stuff. So he employed a, a guy to take his designs and point to point, you know, make everything the same as what was being copied through the years so Benedetto could stay consistent. It would still get it to the point, and then you had to finish it. But um, so I worked actually right next to Benedetto's right hand man, which is Wyatt Wilkie, who's doing, um, who is doing very good stuff. And so we got quite tight. And after a while of setting guitar uh, arch top necks, uh, I got to the point where our, the output was um sufficient at that point so and somebody quit so i put my hand up and say oh i need somebody to do fret work and they're like yeah if you want to do it go ahead they just if you stuck your hand up you could do anything you wanted to do there literally if you wanted to sand if you wanted to do any finishing work they'd let you help in any field if you had the time so um needless to say i was then the fret fret guy next setting i did some final sanding and i tried the, i tried the finishing for a little while, but at that point, you know, just didn't know what I was looking at at all. So um, it, was, it was a good good learning point for me, but I wasn't much help at that time. <laughs> right. right. Why, why would you leave? Yeah, good question. Very good <laughs> question. 
at your at all that absolutely um you know georgia long term uh probably wasn't my sort of climate as, as maybe as trivial as that is but it's like 100 percent humidity 100 degrees all you know seems like all year you're just drenched in sweat i had like i said i've been living in alaska northern michigan and stuff so it was not my climate at all and actually uh, as it turned out um came over what was it a been nine or t whatever it was the dollar dropped um it was a recession sort of that point when the american dollar value plummeted so a month later the the money we brought over to new zealand um just went that li little bit further than it would have a month later <laughs> would that be like oh eight yeah somewhere around there yeah i believe so See, that was, I, I was really established as a repairer by then, and that was sure. a really interesting time, like 07, 08. Oh, yeah. When you had that global financial crisis. And yeah. in the US, there were a lot of really skinned people. Yeah. And the one time when the, when the New Zealand to the US dollar was almost one to one. Interesting. Yeah. And so there were loads of people here buying American guitars on eBay. So yeah, I was getting an awful lot of quality oh, sure. second hand sure. guitars through the workshop. When every week there was something really, really interesting, you know? Yeah, yeah. That'd have been great. That'd have been great. It was, yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, so, oh, so, so around that time you moved to New Zealand. Yeah, yeah, it was around that time. Just, just, just after. But the dollar was was struggling and whatnot because I remember ben, Bob Benedetto pulling us all aside and talking about you know the future of guitars. You know how it come from used to being sells Sears and Sears and Roebuck or the department store things, and then saying it was going to go back to that. And we're all like terrified of of what the future was and. And, you know, uh, he had um, a gentleman running the business. I believe he still does Howard Paul um, at that time. And really, really good uh, businessman. Excellent guitar player. Holy cow. Um, so he was him and Benedetto teamed up when Benedetto got his name back from from Fender, I think, for a spell, <laughs> which was an interesting time. But anyhow, great two years, learned so much and uh, worked with a lot of great people. Um, on guitars every day going to work. I remember being so excited to get to work. You know, it was, it was great. So. so so how was it setting up in New Zealand? Because you, you turn up, I imagine you had some tools, you've got your skills. Mm, yeah. Oh, um, nice. So I moved, moved to Hawke's Bay first, actually. So that was sort of a base um, for family reasons at the time. For my, uh, my wife at the time, her, um, her parents had moved there and was... Um, working in that area. So I can say I've lived in New Zealand and I've lived in Auckland as well, because it's a it's a very different feel, obviously, anywhere, anywhere outside of Auckland is a slightly different from from the rest of New Zealand. Maybe it's just me. Mm. <laughs> and uh, I had some tools, mostly hand tools and um, specific guitar servicing stuff started. I actually I was picking apples in, in Hawks Bay. The neighbor came over and I was building up a shop, making a workbench. And he says, uh, want to come do some uh, pruning, I think, is what he wanted. He says, we need some help. So at the time, I was like, no, no, focused on this. And, and then eventually I says, oh, yeah, you know what? This is going to take a while anyway. So might as well save some save some money uh, working for a, a local orchard just out the back, Hamawana. And um, yeah, saved up money, bought some tools. And it's been a, it's been a long, slow process. But um, on and on. Uh, cool. I've been here about 11 or 12 years, and so uh, for, full time here for four. And so before that was evenings and weekends heavily for a few years in, in Onihanga. But um, yeah, I really, really got busy when I opened the guitar build shop. People, Kiwis, you know, they come into the shop, they see the tools and they see guitars that you're working on stuff. And a lot of them say, oh, shit, I can do that. Um, and, you know, they being that I did it and then I went to school and learned how to do it, I figured, well, yeah, sure you can. So you just it'd be an advantage. A lot of Kiwis have done it themselves without any help and they've done some great stuff. So um, I've just given them a little bit of a head start or a little bit of facilitated, I guess, the, the guitar building yeah. a bit. So yeah, I really enjoy that. I, I actually had done a lot of projects with people, different either random stuff that they had started themselves uh, with the guitar build shop b before I actually branded it and and started well I didn't even really promote it properly but 
like kids would come in and say, oh, I want to do this for my school project and I think I can do it. And they have the vision and they know a lot about the ins and outs that, you know, you got to research and this stuff that I wouldn't have known at their age. So I was like, oh, yeah, sweet ass. So let's let's get you building something and helped several people do this for a while. And, and I actually had planned to do it in the future as well. Um, when I well, from the day I went to guitar building school, you realize you count the students, you realize you look at what you're paying. And then you realize, holy cow, these guys are, <laughs> this is a clever idea. So, um, but not only that, is it's a lot of fun. People come in and, and you set them up working on a project. And at the end of it, they get a guitar that they've made themselves. Um, one or two of, you know, are songwriters. And so they've um, built a guitar themselves that they play songs that they've written themselves and they perform. And, and that's really, it's really cool to see. Yeah, that's great, isn't it? Mm. That is cool. You know, when when I when when I, I talk to people who who have not so much built from scratch like like you guys are doing, but I, I talk to a lot of people who who get loads of parts together and build a build a strat or, or something, and they always say how much they learn from oh, it. Yeah. You know, they thought they knew a lot about the guitar beforehand. Yeah. But not until you really start doing those things that that you, you that you really do know what's inside there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I really, I really enjoy that. So you, you're making acoustic guitars as well as arch tops. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I make uh, a variety of instruments. Um, I even have a um, uh, arch top ukulele uh, design that um, me and a ukulele enthusiast and a great player. Um, have designed together and he's put down he's like listen I got something I think it'll work and so we designed it together and put it out and it's a really cool that's a really cool thing it's on the website um, sort of tenor tenor size slightly smaller but uh, I figured building arch top guitars I wanted to see if I had something to offer the the uh, ukulele enthusiasts that are in New Zealand and uh, I think it sounds great um, you got to use a certain combination of timbers to to get the sound that I want out of it <laughs> but um yeah no they're they're fun to make they're they're really beautiful little little instruments i think so which which timber do you use on those i use a, the top most specifically is a uh, western cedar all right so it just gives it that lighter lighter sound lighter feel it can deal with a lot of stress um because it's really stiff but then very lightweight as well so i feel it moves it moves at the right point you gotta you know work it work it to the point as well but um i tried spruce as well and other other ones yeah i've tried more of the the pale spruces and they're a bit stiff a bit rigid but they they sound nice but i really think that cedar was the <laughs> stumbled across it and thought i had i had a bit of it really beautiful straight grain quarter sawn stuff and i was like oh the heck we'll try this and it was brilliant so right see i i think i think the um spruce and cedar sound like their color like mm. the Engelman, Engelman is a really really light yeah. and then uh, you, pretty much probably the lightest I, I guess then you get through, through like Sitka and then when you've yeah. got cedar which is a much warmer color and I think it's a much warmer sound sure yeah yeah I mean if I'm building a, an acoustic for myself it'll be it'll be a cedar top for sure right. which is yeah I, I you, you see a lot of them but um and they have their issues with with feedback if you're ever playing live potentially or uh, you know um, you can get around them other ways, but I really think that that a cedar top is is my my ideal. <laughs> okay, okay, and and I mean I, I I don't know for a fact, but I hear that they they age more quickly, so so they mature mm. more quickly. I should say. Oh sure, C could be the crystallizing of the of the whatever muck inside of the pores and whatnot probably probably ages differently i know that it was sort of a sort of a rage the big boomy sounds back in the 70s you know when you had different players playing for big rooms and that and nowadays i find that you get a lot of tight tightly made guitars very bright because they're all going to amplify them anyways so you're going to put that low end in there somehow um so uh, i think the approach to acoustics has sort of changed through the years a bit but um hmm. So you think you think that that what what people want to hear has changed? Um, I I think I think so. Yeah, I think for players definitely. Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, it used to be lots of 
lots of jumbos and dreadnoughts, wasn't it? And now it's more like OM cutaways for, for the singer-songwriter stuff. I think that's, that floods the market. Or, or you see, I see it more as far. Maybe I'm, maybe my, my vision is not correct, but it seems like it back in the day it was the country western, you know, Cat Stevens on big jumbos or, or other yeah. people plonking away on these giant Angus acoustics. And it's cool. It's lovely. Yeah. Lovely yeah, more. so less that big, big, brash, powerful sound and more, more mid-range. Mm, mm. Yeah. Done. Yeah, I suppose that's especially with the, 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 the modern thing for the really small guitars, you know, there's like the Baby Taylors and the GS Minis and all that. That's a really body mid-range Yeah, guitars. exactly. Love the GS Mini. That's a great guitar. You know? They're cool, aren't they? Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah. So are, are, you, are you making many flat tops? Yeah, a few. Yep, I have. Um, I have a dreadnought and a, a parlor on order at the moment, so um, they're they're popular. It's um, it's it's what a lot of people want to when they when they um, have a vision for an acoustic instrument. But uh, I'll, I think the the enthusiasm around the guild, the guitar build shop for sure. When they come in, they either want to do an electric of some sort with some. Um, uh, customization of their own or an acoustic uh, acoustics are quite popular because that's the real beauty of assembling something but um, I have a parlor design that I'm quite proud of and I uh, think it's really neat it's, it's sort of larger than the GS mini but um, only slightly and hmm. that'd be good yeah yeah they need to be yeah slightly bigger is not not about not a bad thing mm, no no I I mean, they're very clever because then you, you just put heavier strings if you want to. You can you can make some ch changes, um, not not as short of a scale, so you know don't have to. But everything's able to be customized. Wow! Mm. So you're you're not doing a range of guitars. You're you're kind of doing the, this, the bespoke one-off. Uh, a, a lot of it ends up being bes bespoke. Um, whilst I I love. <laughs> The ones that I do have in a in a design, you know, and I work like working off of a repetitive thing because you've done it before and you can always improve. Just comes down to the slight improvements, whereas um, the large ones and that you have to spend a bit more time with to to get them to that point. But um, few arch tops through the years as well. The acoustic arch tops, people love to look at them, but um, you know, not a lot of people. And I think you could exhaust the market with the Benedetto style guitars and you know half a dozen instruments in New Zealand probably but yeah yeah, but. yeah I think you're right yeah I, especially especially I don't know about the rest of the country but I know Auckland is it's all very rock and roll mm. yeah um, when I got and I was I was meeting some teachers because I wanted to develop my plane a bit and so I you know I was wasn't starting from the bare minimum but but not far off to be quite honest I'm, I'm a bit of a player more more bass nowadays but I met a gentleman David Ward and he's um he's just insanely good and you know of course there's several but um and and you know he he was doing jazz in this in the scenario that I met him in and I was like man you you really got what you know the what you see stateside heaps of he has that you know, in, in spades, which was which was encouraging to see, you know, because you know, you, sometimes you have to look a bit harder in New Zealand to find people wherever they're hiding the, you know, the great jazz, jazz cats. But um, he's excellent. So I wanted to build him a guitar and he's like, oh, how about a telly? That was that was it for me because I love tellies or they're, they're my favorite for sure. Um, and I was like, all right, well, sure, let's, let's do that. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, I like tellies. Yeah. Yeah. They're. Um... Yeah, there's something. If you if, if 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 you're playing well and you sound good on a telly, then you know you really are sounding good, mm, right? Because they yeah. can be they can be harsh, mm. you know. And if you're having if you're having a bad day, they're not afraid to tell everyone else. Yeah, I, I like that about them. Yeah, are you a neck pickup or a bridge pickup guy? Oh, bridge, bridge. Yeah, yeah. I, I pretty much only ever play with other people, so. Uh, Often you Fair get you're up and you get lost. So so I, I I like to have a very sort of narrow little frequency band and, and I don't cool. have a lot of bass the sound because that just gets in the way of other people. So sure. Um, yeah. Sure. I, 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 and of course a telly is always going to be heard. Yeah. Yeah, it breaks through all right, doesn't it? Yeah. 
Yeah. And like, like, and, and, and really, if, if you're not having a good night and you really don't want to be heard as much, there is the neck pick up too, isn't mm. there? <laughs> true, true. Are you playing a bit out? Oh, uh, playing. I've been in, in the same covers band for 15 years. Oh, cool. I, I know. They, they just want, it's just best mates. And um, yeah. so we normally we would gig about once every four to six weeks, although times are a little different at the moment. Right. Yeah, sure, sure. Just a night out with your mates, you know. That's it. Do you do, do you play out at all? No, I don't. Uh, I have in the past, but no, it's um not something I do at the moment. <laughs> yeah, well, if you hey, if you're playing bass now, there's uh, there's always a need for bass player. Yeah, oh yeah, it's true. It's true. Oh, one day, one day we'll see. <laughs> see, I've I've got a question for you. Yeah. Um, what what finish do you like to put in the back of a neck? Hmm. Yeah. Um, I really like a true oil neck, actually. Um, yeah. I think that true oil is a real win. Um, I find a lot of people, once you do the real elaborate finishes and this and that, a lot of them just, when you want to feel it, you don't look at it all that much. Well, yeah, you, actually, you, you kind of do look at it sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, but it doesn't matter what it looks like, really. Just the true oil is a great feel. feels right in touch with the wood and, um, yeah, smooth. Um, yeah. yeah. But um, no, don't do it unless, you know, I, I, I tell people, a lot of people come to me and say, sand this off and put, put an oil on it. I'm like, yeah, yeah, cool, sweet. I can, I can understand that. Mm. Yeah. I like, um, I, like, I really like shellac. Yeah, yeah, well, true, true. Yep. I mean, obviously, it's a nice color, too. But, um, but no, that, for me, that's a really nice, that's, that, that's my favorite feel. Sure, yeah, yeah, sure. No, shellac's great. I like a shellac neck as well. Hey, so when you with with making and repair and and, and all that, I've, I've I was talking to somebody oh, a couple of months back, and we and we were talking about how you cope when you're having a bad day. Oh. <laughs> like, no, 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 not generally. Words I mean, been getting out about me, eh? My thought, <laughs> my thoughts are that's what jigs are for. If you've got lots of jigs, I think well that makes you still really good on it when you're not completely on fire. All right. That that's my sort of thinking of. I'm I'm a big maker of of jigs and guides and, and okay. bits and pieces. Sure. Maybe you don't. Maybe you maybe you you're just always good. <laughs> it's just me. Oh no. Nah. Um, I I do use a lot of jigs. Um, but when you're doing a lot of different types of instruments, you you always have a uh, a way that it will go correctly even when something doesn't go to plan it will still have a hundred percent success rate right. um it will always it will always come out well so um I'm, I'm very much a realist and a pessimist actually you could probably say and so i always plan for the worst yeah no and, fair enough yeah but um spending a lot of time making different jigs and, and that sort of thing i do i do a degree of that of course you, ha you have to and it's always Things go very smooth when you do that, but sometimes the situation doesn't always allow. Yeah, I think I think that's I, one thing I'd do if I had a CNC mm. or a laser cutter or something. I'd probably make lots of guides. Probably spend way too much time doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you uh, do by? Like, yeah, when it came to the the acoustic, I guess is bit of a confessional of mine when I got into doing tuning tuning of tops you know and tap tuning they told us at school they says now you can you can geek right out on this and you can do the the grams and the boxes and the different ways of measuring all that he said they say and that's good and that's correct and they said and there's also people <laughs> that that know and can feel everything everywhere and they develop that and you know there's both sides you know one way or the other are correct and any degree of either, I suppose, is, is correct. So, um, you know, when you're when you're tuning the pieces, the guitars that go together, and, and getting to that right, you know, to that point, um, I I told myself if I'm going to do this, I'm going to learn how to feel it and hear it, even if my first guitars uh, are not uh, exactly correct, because um, usually if you if you stand on the backs of the giants of the people that have done these plans and, and told you all these things and what to look for you can usually start out head and shoulders above a lot of production anyways so 
you know, you're already starting ahead of production, that's where you want to be. And then you can get miles ahead of production. That's I, that's the way I look at it anyways. Yeah, yeah. So tell me more about, about tech chaining. Well, how, how you do it. Well, yeah. So when I tune a top, like an acoustic, either a flat top or, or an arch top, actually arch tops are a little more tricky because you got to tune them when they're on the sides. Um, so when you're going in, going around the edges of the guitar, um, which is where the relieved point of the sound is. I feel funny telling you all this. <laughs> well, <Why? laughs> because you're a Mr. Glenn who knows very much about guitars, but never mind. No, 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 no. Go on, so tell me. I'm, 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 I, I, I don't know much about this. I'm really, I'm really interested. Um, the relieved areas around the sides of the guitar, which, you know, if you ever crank your sub up, you know, on your speaker system or whatever, and you see the, the speaker move in that, you know, pushing the sound, moving air, you know, that's what your top's doing. Um, and a lot of people don't, you know, it's just cool to see. It was sort of a clicking point for me when someone says, well, a string between two brick walls really wouldn't make any sound, would it? Except for maybe a little bit of the air disturbance directly around the string. I was like, oh, yeah, I never thought of that. And he says, well, it's because the top's that's moving. I was like, oh, far out. And they're like, well, the top has to move, so let's find a way to make it move more. And that's by, you know, uh, relieving the structural integrity to the point of collapse or just before hopefully <laughs> and then you have a pretty good open sounding guitar in certain places and a bit of weight here and there of course but um, on arch tops you would scraping around the edges and very much you know Benedetto would show us it's very much what you hear when you're scraping yeah. um, and and the, the people that that were there at the shop you scrape and then and then after a while it sounds like and is that coming through are we, we going to get that on the recording? Are you gonna right, play, I like play, it. Play yeah, that yeah. out. <laughs> more, more made up for cavalry. It's great. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> oh dear. Anyways. Yeah. Okay. See, going back to the GS Mini, I don't know if you've oh, noticed looking on the inside, the yeah. underside of the top. There's yeah. what is it? About three mil wide, right around the edge. Probably a little bit. They get a bit of bottom out out of it. Yeah, they do. Love it. Very yeah. clever, very clever idea. I may have done it myself on occasion. <laughs> it's very, very good idea. Very good idea. They're, they're, they're no fools. They're no fools. No, no, no. I mean, but yeah. I mean, I, I, I was reading somewhere, and I think it was the Guild of American Luthiers or something, where they talk, where somebody was referring to a guitar as an air pump, and sure. that really resonated with me. If you yeah. pardon the pun, where yeah. is this the idea? Is this diaphragm is pumping air out out of the port? Um, yeah. and that, mm. that I, I've, re I've thought of, I've thought of guitars that way ever since yeah the um, projection incredible and somebody did this really silly thing at school or they had done it the year before I was there and they actually made a guitar with no sound hole you know and we all sort of stood around it you know looking at it sort of not, what the hell is that you know, <laughs> what is what have they done and actually it projects very well um, certain frequencies it, you know it's still a lot of volume um but the coloring of the notes isn't as intense because you're not getting what's inside coming getting pushed out as well it's just what's on the outside yeah. getting pushed out so um i think what what we decided is that the volume was still there but the coloring of the notes and the frequencies that that top had the potential to um you know express wasn't wasn't getting out to the mm -hmm. listener and so it, it did suffer that way but we all just thought well what's it going to sound like it's going to sound like a, a string between two brick walls but it, it didn't really um hard to explain i suppose that that air pressure that's been developed inside the box it, it mm -hmm. isn't having an outlet have you seen a um a turkish suz oh beautiful thing so very much very teardrop shape okay um, big, big, big bowl back, right? Like a soft wood, sprucey kind of top. But sure. this, the sand hole is in it, and it's in the butt end. Oh right, yeah. It's really small, and it's in sure. the butt end. Right. Now, do they um do some sort of covering with it, or to tune? Some? But I, I, it looked to me when I saw that, I thought, ah, well, that, isn't that just to relieve air pressure in there to allow the top to move more, mm. or I don't know. I'd have to talk to a sales maker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People I can talk to. <laughs> well, I mean, we we sort of 
experimented to whatever de degree you can with um, sound uh, f hole sizes on the arch top guitars, you know, and you sort of go between a few different ones and say, well, these ones have bound f holes, or these ones are unbound but the same pattern cut. So obviously, there's a few mil on either side, and and it did it change. Um, significantly, well, there was a difference between each instrument. That's for sure. How much of that was, to, you know, affected by the size of the F hole? We always speculate. Yeah, see, someone like Taylor is in a really good position mm. to do that because yeah. they are so mechanized. It's just they're just made by robots, so they 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 can really hear the discrepancy. The differences in the woods, I suppose, because yeah. they're not working differently. Whereas, especially if you're tuning a top you're making that guitar work as well as that guitar can work, whereas they want consistency in manufacture. Yeah. yeah. So, and we can see how, how people like yourself can get ahead of the big manufacturers without too much. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. They, they have a pattern that they reproduce every single time, but the materials that they're working with aren't as consistent as, as they'd like them to be. So. Um, yeah, well, neither are mine. <laughs> but, but if you're making them to the materials. Yeah. So, isn't it, yeah, isn't it a shame more people don't kind of get that and go, well, therefore, I mm. get a better guitar if I go to someone like yourself rather mm. than buy from a big manufacturer. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, you can agree with that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You play and, better as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because you've I, just sunk thousands of dollars into a guitar. You're going to practice the hell out of that. <laughs> you know what? That is really, it's very true, isn't it? Mm, definitely. Yeah. I've, I've seen can, it a couple times. Yeah, yeah. You really are. You're going to play. A new bit of gear does make you play. Mm. Hey, so what influence, there's this whole thing with glues, Ooh. you know. Is is there is your know, animal glue? Does it sound better? <laughs> what do you? What do you what? Yeah. Well, there is some voodoo that I that I choose not to take to take too much part in myself. Uh, pretty deliberately, I guess. Um, uh, the wood glues age, and and having worked a little with them, mostly in the uh, restoration side of things and removing it to a degree, and you can kind of see how it's been used, and then. What would have happened? I, I think with glues to, today, you know, they had a, a tradition and stuff, and, and a lot of that was availability and, and consistency. Glues make a difference, absolutely. I'm not going to say that they don't. Timbers, timbers definitely make a dis difference. Um, the crystallizing of the glues is what I guess what people uh, harp, harp on about or geek on about, and probably probably say that's not something that I've chosen to. Um, to chase too much with my instruments, mostly because I don't like the smell of high glue, uh, and I believe that they've they've achieved great things with the technologies of your your fairly traditional uh, type bond. <laughs> yeah, type yeah. bond original is is great to work with, has a good working time. Uh, high glues, especially since I use it for like you know the build shop and that you know you want something that's consistent and always going to work, whereas humidity can. <laughs> change yeah. change the way your hide glue is working sometimes. So, yeah, yeah. See, I don't mind the smell of it too much. No, and, fair um, enough. My, my biggest problem when I when I when I used it, yeah, um, was the dog, because oh. the dog leave me alone. He just just Did loved he? the smell of it. So you'd have this this rip hazard behind you. Right now, I I remember uh, was it a, a golden retriever or something? No, he's uh, he's a, a a German Shepherd border uh -huh. collie cross. Okay. Yeah. This yeah. was We've it's got... been it's been ages since I remember coming you know stopping in the shop because of course if you're looking and sniffing around to get into the industry when you're fresh in New Zealand of course I did show up on your doorstep at some remember? point and said hello and and tripped over the dog or whatever and <laughs> <laughs> he had a lot going yeah. on. And that was yeah. cool. He's, he's still around. He's pretty old now. He's nearly oh, 12. Yeah. Oh, very good. We've got, you know, we got another one as well now. Now, now I work from home. You can have more dogs. Absolutely. More the, <laughs> more the merrier. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I have a cat myself. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, oh, we'll have to introduce them, see what happens. <laughs> she doesn't know anything about guitar. She doesn't care. No, they don't, do they? But they're good to have around. <laughs> Mm. Hey, I'm gonna, cool. I'm gonna make, make a do. set of strings out of her one day. Oh, mate! 
<laughs> Wasn't it sheep that they used anyway? Sheep entrails. Might have been. I know the cat gut was a was a thing, but how how long they, you know, what do you what do you process more of cats or sheep? Obviously, sheep would have been. Yeah, because I looked into um, multi scale guitars a while back. Sure. And I found a reference to multi-scale instruments from 14-something or other. Wow. And, the, yeah, and we think this is a cool modern thing, but it's not. And the reason for that being, and this, this article was saying, the reason being that sheep would not oblige you by producing their entrails in different gauges so oh. that Great. so that for different tune, tuning different string, they went for a different scale length for each one. <laughs> so. That's very considerate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean... I'm sure there's some uh, there's some breeding could could take place there. Mm. <laughs> oh, well. anyway, this would be all over get, us. Yeah. Before we get really silly, I think we'll uh, sure. I think we'll call that day. Very good. <laughs>